Well, thank you, Carrie. Uh, yes, I'm Casey Adams, and I am so pleased uh, to be here with Carrie. And I, I didn't realize it was pronounced so ready. I think that's awesome. I've been calling it Sir Eddie in my head. So this is <laughs> fantastic. Um, when you're thinking about records, uh, rec the word record means different things to different people. And I, I don't mean, uh, you know, your, your old music record. Um, there are different sorts of categories of information. You might have information that you use frequently. Um, I know that for myself, I'm constantly trying to find, okay, what's my EIN number or my, my bin number for Oregon, if you're in Oregon. And these are numbers that are important for your business uh, or other data that's important to your business that just having in an accessible place is gonna make your life so much easier. Um, so there's that kind of information. It's not like you're gonna be audited for it or be in trouble if you can't find it, but you wanna make sure you know where it's kept. And with many of these types of information, um, you maybe don't want everybody to know what it is. There's also information you may need to produce for a third party. So if you're ever applying for a business loan or even a personal loan, um, I don't know how many of you may have applied for a PPP loan. Uh, if you're applying to be certified as a small or disadvantaged business enterprise, you may need to provide tax returns. Um, just for your basic bookkeeping, you may need to provide receipts. So this is information that you're going to want to keep for a specific purpose. You've also got information that you're unlikely to need like on a regular basis, but you may be audited for. And so what immediately comes to mind is uh, the four I nine, when you hire somebody uh, showing that you check, verify that they're eligible to work in the United States. Once you hire that person, odds are you're never gonna look at that form again, but you better be able to produce it if asked. Um, the same can be said for uh, training records. Um, there are certain things um, I'm thinking for example, of the harassment uh, and, and sexual harassment training in California in particular, um, you need to be able to show that you've met those training requirements for all your employees. So again, something that you want to be able to find if you need it, even though you probably aren't going to need it every single day. You've got uh, information that can be easily retrieved from a third party. And you're going to hear us talk a lot about uh, digital or cloud or electronic records. Nowadays, everything is getting moved online. And that, while it can be a little bit scary because it's different, it's actually fantastic. And what this means is there's a lot of things, uh, a lot of documents that in the past you may have been responsible for, and if you lose it, big whoops. But now you can get it very easily, again, a, a second or a third or even even fourth time if you need it. Now, you shouldn't, uh, I, I'm hopefully that you're not, uh, losing it left and right. But if you needed, uh, for example, a certificate of insurance and you couldn't find your copy, no problem, call up your broker, they can get you another one. Uh, sign up for those online bank statements. You don't need to have a file cabinet full of these paper documents. So it's nice when you're thinking about what do I need to save? Ask yourself, you know, can I find it again uh, if I lost it? And then information that documents important activities or decisions. And so these are going to be documents that um, capture your procedures, uh, that, that capture your meeting minutes, um, even just notes that you take about an important phone call where maybe you decided um, uh, to move in a different direction with your business or you okayed an expenditure or even hiring um, and firing and performance notes. So there's information that really capture where your business is at this particular place and time. Now, the number one rule for record keeping though is if you can't find it and you can't use it, there was really no reason to keep it in the first place. And what I think about is my, my dear sweet husband who has a filing cabinet full of papers. Now, the problem is he can't find any of the important papers. And so therefore there is really no point in keeping the papers in the first place. If you can't find what you're looking for, there's no point in keeping it. And again, this is where you're gonna hear me come back to that digital, uh, the, the rule of thumb with digital stuff. If it's digital, you can likely find it because most of these digital systems have extremely powerful search features. So it's really more of learning how to save files in a way that allows you to find them again, having a um, 
when I first started, I would just randomly save files with whatever. And I didn't realize until I met Carrie and she told me about filing conventions. I realized, oh, if I file something the same way every time, it makes it so much easier to find. And so really thinking about how are you going to name your files? How are you going to tag or label them to make them easily um, accessible in a digital search system? So when you're deciding what to keep, there are a few things to ask. Can it be easily replaced or provided by a third party? So that's like those bank statements we were talking about or that insurance form. Is there a regulatory or compliance reason to keep this? Are you likely to be audited for this or be asked to prove this uh, you know, to somebody or some agency? And then how often do you need to access it? So again, the EIN or the BIN number, I know that I have to use that at least a couple of times a week. So I wanna make sure, you'd think I'd have memorized it by now, but I haven't. Um, I need to make sure that it's in a place that I can get it right away. Um, and so that means not having it filed way back where I can't, can't ever find it again. And now Carrie's gonna talk about the different types of records that you're likely to have and give a few examples of each. Thanks, Casey. It's really funny. I can also tell an anecdote about one of my coworkers years ago whose desk was totally chaotic and you'd ask her for something and she could find it in 13 seconds. You had no idea how she could do it. It was really, really amazing. Still one of the most, most amazing feats I've seen. Casey introduced us to some criteria around the decisions of whether or not I keep something um, and, and really getting an idea of how to make a record accessible to you. We're gonna deep dive now into the different types of records, starting with your financial records. And as Casey mentioned, a lot of these digital or electronic, or sometimes you'll hear enterprise system, or sometimes you'll hear cloud-based systems. These tools, uh, especially with regard to the financial records and, and almost all these tools, allow you to actually attach a digital version of a record to a transaction or an entry in the tool. This can simplify your record keeping and your, re, your ability to retrieve it significantly because it becomes event-based or situational-based rather than you trying to remember something sophisticated on that. And QuickBooks, Quicken, uh, Microsoft, Money, uh, there are a few other tools that are off the shelf, all provide that ability to maintain your financial receipts but there are a couple other things to consider with regards to financial records. With regard to your um, documentation, if you are tracking all of your finances, your inflow of cash, your expenditure of cashes, your obligations to pay in a manual method, you're going to want to keep your general ledger. That's a physical book. You're going to want to keep all of the reports you generate to show what your monthly behavior is or your biannual behavior is. And I'm talking simply about finances, nothing else. The other thing that comes into play here addresses the bank statements that Casey mentioned. Even if you are fully electronic, you're using QuickBooks or Quicken, you're using an online banking access and you're getting your statements, we love to help our customers do their monthly bank reconciliation. And what's interesting is a, a number of our customers don't see the value of a reconciliation report. We really help them to understand why you should use the, generate it first of all, then use it for a quick self audit, but more importantly, retain it. Because in the event that you are uh, subject to an audit, a reconciliation report can sometimes be your exit out of having any kind of penalty or fine because you can show the actual date and, and the activity of your bank accounts against what your records are in your financial system, whether that's manual or electronic. So your financial reports are, are mostly um, pretty self-explanatory in the fact that you definitely want your general ledger, you want your transactional receipts, you want your reconciliation report, and then as far as other reports you'll generate, such as your profit and loss statement, your balance sheet, these are other things that you'd want to maintain. Personnel records are another suite of records that have regulatory or compliance aspects to them, as well as just good business practice. And as I mentioned, when we first got started, 
There are some personnel records that you absolutely have to maintain for compliance, and that is compliance with the Fair Labor Standards Board and each of the state equivalents of that board. Uh, we're a state, we operate in three states, so we have varying degrees of uh, uh, firsthand experience with some of these entities. But you are required to maintain records that include your procedures for hiring to ensure that you are not implying, uh, applying any form of discrimination or uh, special case hiring is the generic term anymore. So you'll, you'll wanna keep your procedure for hiring as well as all records of an interview or conversations related to hiring for compliance purposes. But you also wanna keep all records related to negotiating the, the terms of employment. That's what will help you down the road when you're trying to work with your, your newly hired or eventually hopefully long-term hire uh, when you're thinking about perf uh, performance review or you're considering a raise or in the event that they become disgruntled or dissatisfied. So you definitely need to keep that information. If you have uh, complaints about an employee, by law, you, are, you don't have to maintain the complaint as um, per se, but you have to maintain is a record that you received a complaint, you noted what the complaint was, and you took action on it according to your procedure. So those are the types of things you might have. Um, and there's a, a number of different things along that line. And then with regard to timesheets and some of the other nuances, some of these are state dependent, some of these are just good business practice. And uh, from a compliance perspective, oh, excuse me, from an invoicing perspective, you may need your timesheets. There are then those legal and operational documents that you absolutely have to keep. And one of the documents I really wanna emphasize here is if you have a board of directors, even if you are a single member of a board of directors, you need to have a record of a formal meeting according to your operating agreements or bylaws. So please take a look at that. Uh, sole proprietors do not have to have a, a board of directors meeting, of course. But there are other legal documents, such as your formation documents, that you'll want to maintain your registry with your states. Again, as Casey mentioned, when we talk about helping companies to obtain the uh, small business certification or disadvantaged business enterprise certification, the applications for those, which include a number of documents that we're talking about here, you'll want to maintain those applica applications until you receive that certification. So those are some examples of the legal uh, documents that we keep. And then finally, you'll have the insurance um, certificates, operating permits, business licenses. These are all types of documents that you can be audited for, you can be held accountable for by your customers. If you have any form of an implied warranty, you would want to maintain a warranty statement along with your warranty policy. Um, one thing that's not on our list, and I just wanted to throw it out from an operational perspective because I'm seeing a trend of some folks, especially in light of COVID, um, your PTO policies, your time off policies need to be documented. And it's, it's no longer allowable for you to just say, I'm going to give someone two weeks vacation and that's just going to be my default policy. You need to write that down and have that in a policy that you communicate to your entire staff. So whatever your PTO policies are, need to be documented. And we have a lot of experience helping companies get that in place. So don't hesitate to reach out to us if you need some help. The, the law is really specific about personnel performance. And, and uh, I, I go into a little bit of detail here, but I, I promise I'll talk quickly. Um, by law, employees must have access to any records that are specific to that employee or that employee's performance. So what we guide in our customers, especially if they have supervisors that they're leading or coaching, is that if you need to maintain notes on performance or concerns or positive activity, please just do it in a generic notebook and then incorporate those notes as part of your formal performance review activity. If you start creating file folders that have an individual's name on them by law, you are obligated, if they ask, to provide them with a copy of everything in that file. The other thing you have to keep in mind, and this pretty much speaks for itself, is you can't let employees see other employees' information. And of course, I think most of you know that. Um, one, one thing that we talk about a lot is this concept of confidential with regard to records. And I want to differentiate that from this word proprietary that a lot of us use. 
In the term of confidential, we're going to speak about documents that you've identified that are essential to your business success. These are documents that could contain sensitive information about humans, about people that you employ, or they could contain sensitive information about your customers, depending on the nature of your business. An example would be a lawyer, a doctor, or um, a mental health professional. Those records are all confidential to their clients. And there has to be rules about who within the organization, within your organization, has access to those records. You need to think about um, the fact that if you are keeping employee records or you're going to be giving a raise, oftentimes your human resources and finance group are going to know about that sometimes before the employees do. And this is really true if it's coming towards a termination situation, especially if it's for cause. So we can talk a lot more about that. Um, and and in, as a bottom line, our recommendation is this is not an area to take lightly. So make sure you're protecting all of your employee info. And we would say it's better to be overprotective than it is to be underprotective when it comes to employee records. Yeah, and just to kind of jump on, on that and ditto Carrie, uh, Kim and I were chatting before the presentation began and she was, you know, she gets a lot of applications across her desk for different things. And she said that, you know, there's a lot of times that sensitive information has not been redacted. And, um, you know, you can redact it with the old fashioned Sharpie, but uh, Adobe gives you the option to do it as well. And, and so there are many different ways that you can just make sure you just ask yourself, is this information needed for whatever I'm doing? It's kind of a need to know basis. And is this information about myself that I would want out there for the world to see? And if the answer is no, then it's best to, to, to treat your employees or your customers with that same level of respect. Now, talking about these record keeping systems, uh, they all have pros and cons. Uh, you know, we all started out with the hard copy. And you know, that's that paper ledger book that Carrie was talking about, or the filing cabinet with your manila files, your Rolodex. Um, and those are really great because um, you know, if you know how to use them, you can find stuff quickly. You've got that sense of security that you are in control. Uh, it can be used when there's no power or no internet. You know, with the COVID, I I keep you know, having, oh, sorry, my, my Wi-Fi is being funky, you know, and with hard copy, that's not an issue. But, um, you know, it takes up a lot of space. There is a limit to what you can put in a filing cabinet. Um, it can be hard to find stuff. And if you misplace it, good luck finding it. Or if you're like me and you have small children who come and grab pieces of paper off your desk because they want to doodle on something, you know, whoops. Um, and, you know, it's, it, they're vulnerable to natural disasters and like the fires that we all experienced this past summer, you know, that really hit home for a lot of people. If you don't have it in some other fashion, you may lose records completely. So you might think, okay, well, what's, what do I do? Well, you've got two kind of basic options, digital, which is where it remains on your computer, for example, and you remain in the driver's seat. And then what we kind of refer to as in the cloud, which is just kind of up in the air. No, it's, uh, it's, it's off on some other server and you can access it from anywhere. And there's pros and cons to both of these. Um, it's really nice when you have something downloaded to your actual machine, you know that nobody else has access to it. And, um, you know, it's, it's great. It's in your control. It's easy to share. It's searchable. It's easy to update information, but if your hardware fails, if your computer uh, has some sort of hiccup, you can lose everything. Um, and so you really wanna make sure that if you are keeping things in, in, on your computer that you have a hard copy backup somewhere. So you can get an external drive. Um, that's one way people do it. Um, it's kind of a, a long learning curve if you're used to hard copy and there's a cost associated with it because you do need to make sure that you have the digital technology. Um, and one of the issues that we run into with customers who have say an accounting program on their machine is it makes it very difficult to collaborate with your service partners. So for example, if you were a customer of ours and you wanted us to take a quick look at your books and you've got QuickBooks, but it's not QuickBooks online, it's QuickBooks desktop, we're not going to be able to jump in and, and help you out. So that's one thing to consider. 
Now for the cloud, some people get really nervous because you're not maintaining that control um, and that can make people uncomfortable. Um, Though it's very convenient though, it's super easy to share. It's actually pretty safe if you um, are really careful about using a reputable company. Um, it requires almost no physical space. It's infinitely searchable. And what I really like about it is you can work from anywhere. So, you know, if you had a natural disaster, grab your computer, go, you can work from your hotel room. Or, you know, the weather is beautiful. I often take my laptop and work from around the campfire. And because all of my important documents are located in the cloud, I can access them from anywhere. Which is also nice if a customer calls you up in a panic and says, oh my goodness, I need help now. I don't have the excuse of, well, I'm not in the office, sorry. You know, I, I can access it. I can access it on my phone even these days. Um, the thing with that is though, you do need to remember to make sure you know your passwords, because if you lose your passwords, all can be lost. Conversely, there are some fantastic password uh, softwares that can really help you out with that. And we can chat about that later. Um, so just some examples of some record keeping systems that we've come across. Um, certify, that's something that you, know, you can scan your receipts or email receipts to, um, Adobe Scan. There's the traditional scanner, like many of you may have sitting next to you on your desk right now. Uh, cell phones, a lot of smartphones have some sort of capability to take a picture and turn it into a PDF or turn it into some emailable document. Scannable um, is another great option. And in terms of, of saving that information, a lot of people, if you use a Microsoft uh, 365, you have access to SharePoint, which is a very nice and secure digital storage system. Um, and then just thinking about, you know, you know how, how you might use these tools, you've got online accounting software. We mentioned uh, QBO, that's a popular one we've seen. And then signing up for e-statements wherever you can so that you can make sure you can access your documents, your insurance documents, your bank statements, your bills, all online. So, you've got all these documents and now you need to figure out how long do I have to keep these documents? And it can be really confusing because depending on the state um, that you're in or if it's a federal requirement, uh, depending on the type of document, they have different, there, there is no set like, oh, seven years, that's it. Um, that's just not true. There's so many different <laughs> requirements based on so many different things. The only rule of thumb is that you need to keep it for as long as you need it, <laughs> and then some. So because of this, um, what I recommend, of course, is going digital and then, you know, if in doubt, keep it because you can always find it. But you can also go to the irs.gov website. They have a list of retention schedules for everything that they might be interested in. And there's several CPA organizations um, and other sites online where you can find uh, different retention schedules, especially through the state. If you go to your state uh, secretary of state's office, um, they are able to tell you exactly how long you need to keep different documents. The same with uh, Department of Revenue. They're able to let you know about their taxation documents as well. But again, if you can't find it, it doesn't matter that you kept it in the first place. So whatever you do, make sure it's something you can retrieve. And again, just to solve the entire headache, if you move to digital, you don't ever have to worry about retention requirements because you can have everything at your fingertips with just a simple search. So about different states, um, as Carrie mentioned, we operate in uh, three different states. And for some reason, the, the states don't talk to each other. So they've all come up with their own rules. Um, and the best rule of thumb that we have found is to go with the most restrictive and then apply it to everybody. Um, so if you are working um, in Oregon and you, know, you, you find that Oregon has the most restrictive break policy, you're going, that's the policy you're gonna document and you're gonna apply it to everyone. It doesn't matter that maybe Washington doesn't need to have a break after two hours. It's in terms of your sanity and the time and the likelihood of making a mistake, it's best to pick one policy and apply it to everyone. And of course, you're going to go with the policy um, that or the retention schedule that is the most locked down. 
So, so what does all this mean, right? Uh, who, who really cares, right? Well, you know, records, they're evidence of performance, regardless of type. They're records that can provide um, a record of the decisions that you've made and why you made them. And that is so important as your business grows. You need to be able to look back and say, why did I do that? <laughs> and, you know, they add value beyond supporting auditing. Although so being able to support an audit is incredibly important. It's, it's not the be all and end all. And, um, you know, just making sure that you understand what's happening with your business, where your money is going and why it's going there can really go a long way to providing stability for your organization. So if you want to further explore your individual record keeping requirements, because it's different depending on the type of business you have and the industry you're in, uh, Carrie and I would be happy to sit down virtually and talk to you about your unique situation. Um, to close out the workshop, you know, we can answer some questions. Uh, we're going to actually email you out or Soretti will email you out a uh, survey and we would be very appreciative if you would take it and just let us know how we did and what more you'd like to know or if you have any questions that come up later. Um, so I guess we'll open it up for questions unless Carrie, do you have anything else you'd like to add? I can add a lot, Casey, but we're on limited time frame. That's right. I probably, probably one of the things that uh, we did not cover in this presentation, and it might be a suggestion for our future presentation of this topic is uh, regarding the value that records offer, we touch on the fact that they give the historical evidence of the decisions you made, but what records also provide is the launching pad or the foundation for a more detailed analysis, for example, monitoring trends. And that's a type of work that our communities also provides for our customers, where we're looking to see how marketing efforts have worked. And we look at the records of the contacts and how often a contact was made and whether or not it resulted in a sale. And if it did, how big that sale was. And we can't do that type of analysis without those records. Oftentimes uh, in starting that type of work, we'll consume too much of the owner's time for it to be meaningful because they've kept everything in their head. And if you find yourself keeping everything in your head, it's probably a good idea to consider maybe that's the time if you're going, if you have plans to grow your business, that's the time when you want to start jotting things down. And then we can work on finding a good way to uh, keep it and recall it when we want to do that analysis. But that's about the only other, other thought I had uh, as, you're, as we were presenting. Yeah, Carrie and, and Casey, one of the best recommendations that I've heard from small business owners is that they actually um, just block out a couple hours every week. And during that time, you know, they'll go through and either jot down ideas in their head of, you know, things that they want to get through or go through and update records and maintain them so you don't get that backlog. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I've seen throughout my history as, as a really successful method. I know nobody wants to say, hey, every Friday afternoon, I'm going to sit down and do bills or scan documents or whatever, but um, it really makes things so much simpler when when there is something that you need or when you are in a pinch for that financial document okay. somewhere. A, a couple of thoughts on that, Kim. We That's a standard time management recommendation for everybody, right? Regardless of what your role is, is to carve time out for that personal note taking. And I absolutely stand behind that. But one thing we've noticed with business owners that they're trying to grow their business is unfortunately their customers, their potential customers didn't read that same manual. And, and they may want to have meetings at those times when you've, you've intentionally blocked out time and the challenge of rescheduling may mean a loss of opportunity. So um, we just need to be mindful that I think the key thing that you're really highlighting that we would recommend is figure out a system. Figure out a system that really works for you. If, if carving time out to do notes, which I, I do that myself actually, and have for 35 years, almost 40 years, if that system works, find a way to make it agile around the world you're trying to operate. Meaning I may not be able to find it at the same time every day of the week. I might have to flex a little bit that 
I have a, a opportunity coming up on Friday morning or maybe Thursday afternoon. And so I allow the, there to be a little bit of flexibility in that. And that really helps because um, there's nothing I, I like worse. Yeah, I'm not sure if that makes sense, mm -hmm. but there's nothing I dislike more. There we go. Then having to tell a customer, I'm sorry, I can't meet with you uh, for any reason. And uh, because they're they we are here to serve their needs, no matter how urgent those are to them, it's it's important to them. And I'd hate to be in a situation where we weren't able to respond quickly because of that. Well, and you know what I do to try to get around that, um, as somebody with small children, I have found that uh, you know time is so precious. And so I try to take a few minutes every day either before typical operating hours or after. And so that way, you know, there are very few times that a customer expects you to be able to meet with them at say 7.30 in the morning or 6.30 at night or even right before bed, nine o'clock at night. But that's a good time for me. My children aren't around yet. Um, nobody, nobody else is in the office, so they're not needing me. And I can just take a few minutes every day to make sure I've got every, all my, all of my stuff squared away and I know what I'm doing and where I'm doing it. And ultimately, I think the, the key with record keeping is you need to find a system that works for you and for your employees if you have them, because if the system doesn't work, then you're not gonna use it. And if you don't use it, then um, you're not gonna have those records when you need them. Hey, Casey, uh, Robert Stern asked a question regarding the retention of records when you are originally setting up for a cloud-based service and you no longer want to use it. And since we just went through this ourselves, yes, I, I feel like we can speak to this. So there, I have not yet seen a cloud-based service that when you decide to discontinue, they don't provide you an option for outputting all the records that you've put into the system. QuickBooks certainly does this. And other tools do this where uh, you may have uploaded a tremendous amount of data to their system and it, now you're closing out or you're transferring to someone new. There is a pathway, at least so far I've found a pathway for us, for us to actually export all that data that we've uploaded mm -hmm. over the last couple of years and put it into a, a, a basically a USB or a flash drive and we keep it. And if we need to back it up and go back and upload it to a new system, we can. But uh, in our particular case, we actually transferred all of our data to a new service. And, um, and we did that, we, we made our strategy, our, we planned for that as part of our strategy of changing. And we would encourage you and help you to make that plan accordingly. And I think it took us a couple months to really do it all and complete, but we had a ton of data. And uh, I imagine we're only two years old now. I imagine some of you have been operating for a much longer time, so it could take longer, but they do make external hard drives that are very easy, to, multiple gigabytes that are very easy to use. And we can download all the records to an external hard drive. And what's cool about that is they, they have their own inbuilt security to protect not only the data, but also to protect uh, unauthorized people from getting into those hard drives because you basically can unplug it if you need to. Um, and there's some other techniques as well that we don't, we don't promote downloading records to a hard drive if we can avoid it, but uh, there are pathways to do that. So yeah, yeah. We also were very concerned about payroll records, Robert, when we did this and also our personnel records for some of our employees. And so um, we were very, very mindful of that process, but there are pathways. And most all of these services, if they're even marginally reputable, provide that as part of their FAQs, their frequently asked questions or part of their subscription package. Yeah, and oftentimes you can just, so as Perry said, you can just download it. And I would recommend doing that um, you know, before you cut ties. But often if you're, you're going to a new provider, they often have ways of directly reaching in and, and coordinating that. So for example, um, if we, we just, well, not recently anymore, but we switched um, retirement account providers. And we weren't responsible for getting all of the information. We just had to sign a form telling our previous person that they could give information to the new one. And so as long as uh, you're giving the permission, you actually don't really have to worry about most of it. So again, these are all reputable. You wanna make sure that you're not doing some fly by night, but the real, real companies, the information belongs to you and you have access to it at all times. 
A dovetail question off of this um, uses the term dual records. I just want to clarify something. We're not promoting that there be duplicate records. And, and in fact, you'll, uh, if you were to come and work with us and let us serve you in some manner, we will, you'll actually hear me be very, very clear that we don't endorse duplicate records. What we do endorse is good backup procedures for you, for anything that's digital and if you are if you are downloading something from the internet reckon or from a cloud-based service it is to recognize that I'm downloading that as effectively a backup which is totally cool and we want to encourage the use of that because what we don't want to promote is somebody creating multiple copies of a record whether it's hard copy or digital and storing it in multiple places and the reason why is if for any reason the record needs to be amended, and we can talk a lot about amending records. There, are, there has to be a formal policy for how records are amended once they have been filed. Um, certain records, not all records, but certain records. What we don't want is potentially for a record that's kept in multiple places to be changed in one place, but not the other. And with some of the advances in technology now, we can actually create a master record and just point to it everywhere, anywhere else that we are in the cloud or anywhere else that we are in our network. And we can point to that master record. And that becomes, um, that, that becomes the the primary location that that information rests and then from there if we ever need to make a change we can amend that single record and any other pointer is updated right away we don't have to update it again so um and that's a little bit different and it, it's just a fine point because i don't want you guys to run into uh, problems when you might be making copies of records and keeping them in five different file directories that's not what we're endorsing we're endorsing a, a really nice process for um, backup of our data, of our digital data, or if it's cloud-based, and a good process for pointing to or referencing records as a master record. So we, we can certainly uh, help get that all squared away for you. Great, and I've, I see your contact information in the chat. Um, so so ready is certainly able to help, um, but Carrie and Casey here are, are also the experts. So please reach out to them. They can be reached by email. Um, I am going to go ahead and have access to this recording available after this meeting, and I will also send out um, that handout again. And if you have any questions, please send them. We can, we can certainly share those answers with the group. Yeah, we will definitely send out any answers that we come up with. And we're going to send out that survey too. So please help us out. Right. Yes, please give them some information. Um, and, and again, help us know how we can make these helpful for you.